Hello everyone, my name is Richard Parr. I'm the Managing Director of GFI Europe, and I'll be moderating our session today, where you'll have the opportunity to hear from leading experts on the regulatory, political, and consumer landscape for cultivated meat in Europe. It's great to see so many of you here. This is the first time we've held a digital Good Food Conference, and it's been fantastic to connect with people from all over the world. To kick off this session, I'll run us through our agenda and some guidelines so you know what to expect. We want the focus of this session to be on your questions, giving you as much opportunity as possible to engage with our experts. But first, we'll hear a little bit from each of them to set the scene. Europe is already the world's biggest market for plant-based meat, and the region's cultivated meat companies attracted some 28% of global investment in 2020. Here in Europe, we've got twice the population of the US, we've got five of the world's top 10 universities, and many of the world's leading economies. So Europe really should be a global leader in cultivated meat. But Europe is falling behind countries such as Singapore and Israel in terms of supporting this sector with research funding. As well as that, there are also some regulatory, political and cultural challenges to overcome for Europe to seize the opportunity cultivated meat offers to create local European jobs, tackle climate change and feed a growing population. So our first speaker, Alex Holst, who's the policy manager at GFI Europe, will give us an overview of Europe's current approach to regulating cultivated meat, as well as some of the political context here. We'll then hear from Dr. Chris Bryant, who's director of Bryant Research Limited and an honorary research associate at the University of Bath. Chris is one of the leading experts on consumer acceptance of cultivated meat, and he'll explain the current state of play across Europe. And finally, Nathalie Rollin, co-founder of Agriculture Cellulaire France will take us to France for an introduction to Europe's most challenging political and social context for cultivated meat. We'll then spend the rest of the session taking your questions, so please do drop them into the session chat, not the event chat, as we go along, and we'll cover as many as possible. If you'd like to direct your question to a specific speaker, please make that clear when you submit it. This session will be followed immediately by a networking session, and I'll explain how that will work at the end of our Q&A. Now, just a few quick guidelines on how you can take part, which you'll have seen before if you've joined any of the previous GFC sessions. Please be present and engaged and practice active listening. Please speak courteously to others and respect the ideas of others, and do participate freely in the chat. Whilst not all comments will be responded to, all will be recorded and acknowledged. And as always, anyone making uh, inappropriate comments, I'm afraid will be removed from the event. That's it from me for now. So I'll hand straight over to Alex Holst from the Good Food Institute Europe for our first presentation. Great, thank you so much, Richard. And yeah, also really great to be speaking here today and to discuss with you later on. I'm going to spend just about eight minutes to talk about the regulatory uh, context in the European Union mainly. So if you go to the next slide, before diving in, um, let's just have a look at what we're talking about. Um, as you can see on this map, um, the blue countries um, on this map, these are all the member states of the European Union. And as you might know, um, these countries have completely harmonized their regulatory food safety approval frameworks. So that means if any cultivated meat company or cultivated um, uh, meat producer wants to sell in any of those countries, they need to first apply for pre-market authorization at the European Union level. Um, once that authorization is given, um, a company can sell all their products across 20, these 27 countries. Um, additionally, um, the countries here in green, um, this is Norway, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, and Iceland. Those countries are members of the European Free Trade Association. And those countries have mostly aligned their food safety approvals with the EU. 
There are some nuances there in terms of Switzerland, which has several bilateral agreements with the EU, um, and there are slightly different rules on food containing GMOs. But on novel foods, which is the category we are going to speak about um, over the next few minutes, they are mostly aligned, meaning if a product is approved at the EU level, you can also sell it across those additional four countries. Now, the UK um, here in orange is a slightly different case. As you probably know, the United Kingdom left the European Union earlier this year. And as such, it has completely separated its regulatory um, approval framework. Um, so if you are a company um, and want to sell cultivated meat in the UK, you need to go directly to the UK regulator and apply for approval. The substance of the regulatory approval is fairly similar to the EU ones, but the processes are, are separate. Okay, so let's dive into the EU novel foods process. If we go to the next slide, um, this is just a very, very um, yeah, simplified schematic overview. Um, so these three basic steps of the EU novel food procedure are um, first a company making a request for authorization. So gathering all the information, the evidence, the testing, um, the food safety studies in a dossier and submitting it to the European Commission. Then, at the European Union level, the Commission would ask the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, for a scientific opinion, a risk assessment of all the food safety information that is in the dossier. Um, this is, this is the, the scientific, the technical aspects of the risk assessment. We're not going to, um, to speak about that here more. Um, there are other great sessions um, that deal with the um, technical sides of food safety. What I do want to focus on, um, if you go to the next slide, is this last part of the approval process, the risk management part. Um, this is where the actual approval decision is being taken. We're going to dive in a bit into detail of what that is looking like and what the mechanics of that decision um, looks like. So if you go to the next slide, the actual decision, the legal vehicle, if you will, of um, a food safety approval is the so-called implementing act. This is um, a, a document that contains the approval decision, the authorization, is a product approved, yes or no, it's a binary decision, but it also contains um, additional provisions. Um, these could concern the conditions of use of a given product or ingredient. It can concern specific labeling requirements, um, nomenclature requirements, what can you call the product or the ingredient. And it can contain provisions on post-market monitoring, on inspection requirements, um, and a few others. So the binary approval decision is in there, and that's obviously the most important one. But the, these conditions of use provisions can really have an impact on um, the ability of producers to market their products to consumers. And so these decisions on the Implementing Act, um, these are taken in the so-called PATH committee is the body, if you will, that takes the approval decision. Um, and we, we are going to look a little bit more closely on, on how that is um, made up. If we go to the next slide, this PATH committee consists of two categories of actors. So on the top right, um, all those flags represent the 27 EU member states. These um, are represented by delegates from national governments. So this could be Ministry of Agriculture in Finland, the Ministry of Health in the Netherlands, other ministries uh, or adjacent agencies from all 27 EU member states, they send their delegates in this committee. Um, the European Commission um, is the other central actor here. The European Commission facilitates the entire approval process. It drafts the implementing act. It chairs the meetings of the PAF committee. Um, and it facilitates negotiations. It does not vote formally. It doesn't have direct voting power. Um, those lie exclusively with the member state delegates. But the European Commission plays a huge role in influencing in a more informal way um, the opinion of member states delegates. And of course, the political attitudes and political views on any given food product um, within those member states governments and thus within those member states countries they matter um, when it comes to the final vote as well. So from those uh, descriptions, you can probably already um, guess that this approval decision in itself is political in nature. It does not mean that um, these decisions are necessarily polarized or um, that there is huge public debate arising um, when it comes to these decisions. Most novel foods approvals that we see today or uh, every, every month um, they do not make the headlines um, and the public rarely um, notices them. 
but we could imagine that this um, for specific product categories like cultivated meat and seafood could be different. So getting the politics of um, cultivated meat and seafood right is essential for regulatory approval in the EU. And so um, if you go to the next slide, um, this just um, is really a recommendation to the sector and to companies to take that into account and early on engage with policymakers and civil society, not just at the EU level with the European Commission and other actors in Brussels, that is definitely important, but also on the national level. Um, and engaging is one thing, um, the other is really listening and to take concerns um, that exists within society, with consumers, with civil society, taking those seriously um, and addressing them early on. And that can mean that um, there are concerns that um, some in the sector and, and some of us today here feel uh, might not be based on evidence uh, or might be misguided, but those concerns, if amplified, can actually have real world, world impact on the political decision making when it comes to regulatory approval. And lastly, um, a crucial um, thing to do for the sector is to really organize and coordinate, um, building coalitions within the sector and also beyond. Um, and one example of those within sector coalition building, um, if you go to the next slide, we have just recently witnessed here in the EU. Just at the beginning of this month, Cellular Agriculture Europe, um, which is the new European Cultivated Meat and Seafood Trade Association was founded. They're still under formation, um, but those um, 10, 11 companies that you can see here on this slide, they have decided um, they're coming together, they're collaborating, to um, give a voice to the sector and represent the sector towards European decision makers, towards the European public. And it is this kind of um, collaboration, this kind of coordination that we need more of in order to create the political conditions um, to have cultivated meat and seafood come to market also here in Europe. With that, I want to end it and hope uh, yeah, we will have a good discussion later on and look forward to the next speakers. Thank you. Fantastic, Alex. Thank you. Really, um, really clear presentation and some some really good actionable concrete um, steers for the sector there um, and for uh, other people who may be um, watching this. We've got some great questions coming in uh, on the chat. Keep, keep them coming. Um, we're going to go through all three of the presentations together and then we'll do a, a big Q&A session at the end. So um, keep firing them into the chat um, and, uh, and we'll come to them in due course. And with that, I will hand over to Dr. Bryant to talk about the consumer side of things. Thanks so much, Richard. And uh, thank you for, uh, for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here at the Good Food Conference. Um, so yes, as Richard said, I'll be speaking to you about European markets for cultivated meat, what we know about the consumer data, uh, and what we can say about the future of the sector on that basis. So next slide, please. Before I do that, I just wanted to take a moment to reflect on the background uh, kind of reasons for us being here and wanting to drive this forward. Uh, the three main ones, of course, I'm sure that many people are familiar with these. The substantial environmental benefits of cultivated meat over conventional meat are, are well verified in the most thorough uh, life cycle analyses available. The substantial advantages in terms of public health, not only of antibiotic use, as I show here, but also zoonotic diseases, uh, which are increasingly relevant. Um, and of course, the suffering of all of the animals in the food system today. Uh, on all three of these fronts, there are substantial advantages to cultivated meat over conventionally produced meat. Next slide, please. So what I'm here to talk about really is the consumer data. Uh, and here's some of it from Europe. This is a list of the um, nationally representative samples surveys uh, taken in Europe in the last couple of years. And uh, although we see some variation between different surveys based on uh, how the questions are asked partly, but also some uh, real differences between nations as we see uh, kind of within studies, some of these are from the same study, particularly the top two rows and the bottom two rows. Um, we're generally seeing a lot of these start to congregate around the 40% mark. Uh, and this is the percentage of people who say 
in these nationally representative surveys that they would be willing to eat cultivated meat today. So next slide, please. Uh, in terms of comparisons to a few other kind of related in people's minds products, uh, firstly, one thing that um, people often make the association with is, is genetically modified food. Um, and the data that we have available on this, as I show here, shows that cultivated meat actually does enjoy higher acceptance in general than GMO foods. Um, and this seems to be because people more readily understand the benefits uh, of cultivated meat. Next slide, please. We also see that cultivated meat has a substantial advantage over insect protein, uh, with all of the uh, surveys shown here, bar one, uh, showing a preference for cultivated meat over protein from insects. Next slide, please. And uh, the only category here which, on which cultivated meat is outperformed is compared to plant-based meat, uh, which generally people have higher acceptance rates of plant-based meat. Uh, this is to be expected, of course. This is something that's already available to consumers and many people are, are already eating. Um, so this is the only category that we see cultivated meat getting beaten uh, on, on these comparisons anyway. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll talk a bit now about the kind of benefits, barriers, and uncertainties that consumers think about when they uh, think about cultivated meat. In terms of the benefits, the most commonly cited ones really are kind of selfless motivations, right? Societal benefits, so helping animal welfare, helping the environment. And people often have notions that cultivated meat will be beneficial for global food security and help to food the, feed the world, this kind of thing. So these are the most kind of commonly cited benefits of cultivated meat. Next slide, please. On the other hand, uh, less commonly cited are the potential health benefits. So um, these are things which we can do with cultivated meat, uh, which will give it health advantages over conventional meat. These are things like reducing the saturated fat content, adding omega-3 and other vitamins and minerals. Um, and also accentuating the fact that cultivated meat, unlike meat from animals, is free from antibiotics and other path and pathogens. Um, and really accentuating these kind of personal benefits uh, will help to drive acceptance compared to the kind of more commonly perceived societal benefits. Next slide, please. So here are a few of the barriers that people talk about when they talk about reasons why they might not want to eat cultivated meat. And a lot of it is centered around this idea of unnaturalness. Next slide, please. We can see that this is often um, an expression of some underlying uh, drivers. So food neophobia is a big thing associated uh, with cultivated meat rejection. This is defined as a fear of new foods in general. Um, and people can experience this to different expense, different extents. Uh, there are also just drivers like an emotional disgust reaction or a feeling of distrust, uh, which again might be expressed as the idea that cultivated meat is unnatural and therefore somehow unacceptable. Next slide, please. Linked also to this idea of unnaturalness, people sometimes draw other inferences about cultivated meat which may not really have a sound basis, but they're just in the miasma of ideas about unnaturalness. So people might come to think that there are safety or nutrition concerns associated with cultivated meat consumption. Uh, and some people might infer that because cultivated meat is unnatural, therefore it's somehow unethical. Um, this is kind of a common association that a lot of people make. Next slide, please. Somewhat separate uh, to these other issues, but also related and kind of commonly cited are economic concerns. And in particular, what will happen to the farmers? What will happen to rural communities who can't really rely on meat production for their income? So this is something else that people talk about. Um, but I say that this is not something that's actually really that likely to drive purchasing decisions. Next slide, please. There are two key uncertainties around cultivated meat currently that consumers don't really know and will have a huge impact on their willingness to buy and eat cultivated meat. 
One is the price and the other is the taste and generally sensory experience. A lot of people have the intuition that the taste and sensory experience of cultivated meat might be inferior. They think that it might taste worse or have uh, somehow a worse texture, for example. Um, and a lot of people also have the idea uh, that cultivated meat will be prohibitively expensive and be only something available to very wealthy people. Interestingly, the reverse of that idea has also been expressed, this idea that perhaps cultivated meat would just be a way to feed the masses uh, and then rich people would only be able to have uh, real meat. Um, and interestingly, it seems like the uh, trajectory of cultivated meat may encompass both of those stories at different stages. Certainly at first, it's likely to be more expensive than conventional meat and therefore appealing to kind of a premium market, as I'll talk about. Um, but in the long run, the inputs mean that cultivated meat could become cheaper to produce uh, and therefore could actually be cheaper than conventional meat. Next slide, please. So let's have a look now at some of the markets and messages uh, around cultivated meat. These are some of the predictors of higher acceptance of cultivated meat, which have been observed in different studies. People who are younger, um, living in urban centers, and with higher levels of education, typically, are all more likely to say that they would eat cultivated meat. Men are slightly more likely than women. And interestingly, also heavier meat eaters uh, are more likely to say that they would eat cultivated meat. Uh, those with left-leaning politics, predictably, this seems to be something more and more relevant to kind of meat reduction in general. Um, and importantly, those who are more familiar with cultivated meat are much more likely to say they would eat it consistently so. Um, and one interpretation of that could be to say that familiarity is only going in one direction. Currently, we're at a stage where most people haven't heard of cultivated meat, and yet we're still seeing uh, a substantial proportion willing to try. Next slide, please. One important thing to note with these tendencies is that these two in particular, appealing to males and to heavier meat eaters, are actually the opposite to the trends we see in plant-based meat. And what this tells us is that cultivated and plant-based meat may be able to cater to different parts of the meat reduction market. Uh, and therefore, both of these solutions can actually play a role in the future protein landscape. Next slide, please. So there have been a few experiments run uh, about how best to talk about cultivated meat. Um, on the issue of naming, we now use the uh, terminology cultivated meat. Many people also use cultured meat. Uh, these are very similar in terms of the uh, consumer acceptance data, but there are other kind of consistent uh, consistency reasons why we might lean towards cultivated uh, in terms of some of the other terminology in the space that it fits with. Generally, we want to avoid names that invoke labs, um, cells, anything that can kind of be interpreted as too much science and invoke all of those associations with unnaturalness. Again, on framing, oftentimes, although the media coverage of cultivated meat has generally been quite positive, it's too often shown as this kind of burger in a Petri dish kind of image. Um, and studies have shown that it, unsurprisingly it's kind of more positively received when it's rather framed uh, as a food product and when we talk about the other benefits of cultivated meat and not when it's shown as as kind of uh, very uber scientific innovation in terms of explaining cultivated meat a few studies suggest that more simple explanations tend to play a little bit better than more complex explanations it seems to be the case that the more content there is that somebody can't understand the more likely they're going to uh, have a negative reaction to that explanation. Uh, and the last point here, retaliating, is uh, on the point of how to respond to this point about unnaturalness. And um, the study that we have here has shown, there's a couple of studies which actually show a similar thing, basically trying to argue against this point uh, by saying either that actually cultivated meat is natural because this process of uh, cell division is natural, or that naturalness shouldn't really matter, we shouldn't prioritize that. These tend not to be so effective. Um, and rather the most effective message in our study on this point was um, really just to point back at conventional meat uh, and at all of the hormones and antibiotics and so on that are involved in, in uh, conventional meat production 
and to point out that this is far from natural as well. Um, so that that was uh, the most effective kind of retaliation to that uh, accusation in that case. Next slide, please. So to sum up then, cultivated meat really has the potential to displace demand for meat and with it reducing many of the associated ethical, environmental and public health issues. If we can get this right, we can really achieve a lot in these areas. Cultivated meat is uniquely positioned to appeal to heavier meat eaters, uh, and in particular those people who have been slower to adopt plant-based meat. With the consumer data that we have shows that heavier meat eaters are more likely to say that they would eat cultivated meat, and therefore this is an important tool for meat reduction in general. Initial market introduction is going to be at higher prices and lower quantities, as I mentioned. And therefore, this implies a high-end market strategy uh, of going into restaurants in urban centers, uh, as we have kind of seen in the initial introduction in Singapore. Next slide, please. So long-term adoption of cultivated meat is really going to depend on the key variables of price and taste. These really drive uh, adoption of any food over the longer term. And if those boxes are not ticked successfully, um, then large scale adoption of cultivated meats uh, probably will never happen. In the short term, we can use more appealing frames and highlight the personal benefits of cultivated meat consumption uh, in order to overcome some of the neoph neophobia and perceived unnaturalness that tends to underpin rejection of cultivated meat. And in particular, highlighting potential health and safety benefits might be able to help neutralize some of the concerns that people intuitively have on those topics. Next slide, I believe that is my final slide. Yes, it is. Thank you very much. Uh, here you can see uh, details of my website, my email, and uh, there's a link to the slides, which uh, includes all the references that I mentioned today. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris, for that um, really, really interesting presentation. and. and uh, so many different angles in the in the kind of framing um uh in the framing subsection of things fascinating and, and maybe something that we can get into in the discussion um very good we're making good time um lots of questions coming through in the chat um and some answers coming back as well including some some there from alex on the the, the innermost details of the paths voting uh setup please do keep on uh keep on asking questions um to alex uh, to Christopher uh, or to our next speaker, um, and that will help us drive a good discussion at the end of this. Um, and so uh, for our final speaker, we're going to take a trip across the channel over to France and to Nathalie Roland from Agriculture Cellule France. Hello, everyone. I'm happy uh, to be here today so to talk about uh, the situation uh, in France. So I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Agriculture Cellulaire France, uh, Ag uh, Cellular Agriculture France, uh, which is a non-profit that aims is to uh, inform and encourage uh, cellular agriculture uh, development um, in France. Uh, so we are uh, three co-founders. Uh, I've been working in the, um, on the development of cellular agriculture uh, since uh, uh, 2017. I started uh, working uh, in the field with Marc Post. I worked on a uh, two consumer acceptance study on uh, culture of the meat. And uh, we uh, decided to, uh, to, to create uh, this uh, organization to focus um, on France because we thought that uh, we could experience uh, some opposition in our uh, country. Can go to the next uh, slide. Uh, so the situation uh, in, in France is that uh, at the moment we have uh, no academic uh, research going on and this is why we wrote an opinion uh, column to ask for uh, academic uh, research in France and uh, our article has been uh, signed by um, different uh, researchers and um, and uh, politicians different uh, people uh, and uh, the, the article has been uh, published by uh, uh, a well-known um, uh, newspaper a French uh, newspaper so it's a type of uh, thing that we are doing at ECF uh, but uh, yeah, we can go to the next slide, please. 
we also see uh, in, in France uh, some um, political uh, opposition. Um, for example, uh, when uh, culture meat has been approved in uh, Singapore in 2020, we had our uh, Minister of Agriculture who uh, tweeted that uh, uh, he uh, doesn't want uh, this meat to come to France, he, he will not uh, let uh, this meat come, uh, come to France. And then uh, culture meat has been banned from uh, canteens, uh, so it's no officially banned from uh, canteens uh, in, in France, even if uh, no product is uh, already uh, authorized on the market in Europe. And we saw that uh, during the debate, because they uh, they had a debate uh, to discuss the, the, the ban, we saw that uh, so they, they started uh, using a very negative uh, pejorative team name term uh, for cultural meat and they didn't mention the potential benefits of uh, this meat it seems that they don't they just don't uh, really understand uh, what is cultural meat uh, why we need that what we need to work on uh, the development of uh, alternative proteins uh, what what the point uh, with uh, all of that uh, and we had some uh, reaction uh, in uh, abroad. Um, yeah, in uh, people in other country have been quite surprised to see that uh, uh, culture meat has been banned, uh, even if uh, it's not uh, not available uh, yet. So we have oppositions, but we also see. Uh, so we can uh, go to the next slide. We also see more and more interest from different uh, people and organizations. So, for example, we have uh, more and more interest from um, uh, tra traditional uh, food producers, French food producers, that are reaching us uh, to, to us uh, because they want to know more about uh, about what is happening in this uh, field. Uh, who are the actors? Uh, what's going on? The stage of development of the project, uh, for example. Uh, so it's interesting that we, we see more and more interest from them. And uh, about so what we do, so we can go to the next slide, uh, just to uh, briefly explain so what we do at uh, ACF uh, uh, to improve, to try to improve uh, political media and consumer perce perception. Uh, so what we do is, so we want uh, to educate on, on the topic, we want to inform the people. So we uh, create content, uh, we provide content uh, in, in French. Um, we we um, uh, answer uh, reporters' uh, questions uh, to uh, have the, them uh, writing articles on the topic. Uh, we are part of uh, some uh, program at, at the radio. Uh, we are part of uh, some uh, TV shows where we uh, but just explain uh, what is Sarah culture, what are the product under development, uh, why we uh, develop this product, what are the potential benefits. Uh, so the very bah, we start with very basic uh, information. So we inform the people uh, general, in the general public. We also inform uh, the, um, the actors of uh, the, the food industry. So for that, we uh, directly um, uh, discuss with uh, the well, food producers. We uh, also um, uh, make presentation uh, for uh, clusters, uh, trade associations. We are part of conferences on uh, food, future of food, uh, food tech, uh, different kind of uh, uh, conferences and uh, professional events. We also, uh, so we want to have academic, uh, some French academic research, so we try to encourage uh, research. We um, contact the researchers, we make presentations in uh, schools, in, uh, in uh, universities. Um, and well, this is, I think, very good because we have more and more requests from schools and uh, universities to have a presentation for us to, to come and make presentation on uh, cellular agriculture. Uh, and, and there are schools and universities that are uh, biotech uh, schools, but we can have uh, low, low schools, low universities, uh, also um, uh, schools working on uh, sustainability, so different uh, type of um, of um, yeah, schools and universities. And we also have um, uh, more and more requests from students uh, because they they would like to, to work in this uh, new field or they have a project that they have to, to do on cellular agriculture or they are writing their, for example, master thesis on uh, cellular agriculture. So they, they are looking for information and to be in contact with the, the specialist. Uh, we also inform uh, policymakers Again, it's really about uh, informing, uh, like providing uh, the basic, but the information they, they need to know. And we also uh, try to, to build a network of um, uh, organizations. So we would like to have a, a network uh, with people and uh, different type of organizations uh, to 
uh, really gather the, the people who would like to help and to work on the development of uh, Sierra agriculture in France. So this organization, there are uh, universities, there are uh, networks, for, for example, uh, the, the food tech uh, in France. So this is really the kind of um, things, activities that uh, we are uh, working on. And I would say that uh, we, are, we see more and more interest from different people and organizations is going to the right direction. So even if we see some strong opposition, we also see more and more interest from many people in France. And uh, for the next slide, um, for the, the, the companies that are willing to approach uh, France, uh, we would say that uh, it would be great to so understand the situation uh, in France, uh, understand what's happening here in France, also understand the, the French culture, and maybe also adapt the communication to the French uh, audience. And they also, well, you, you can contact uh, us uh, because we are here uh, to help. Uh, so we are here for the all type of organization and people. So you know, yeah, please uh, can just contact us. And uh, on my final uh, slide, uh, you can have uh, about uh, the email. Uh, we have a website uh, for now it's only in french but we'll have at, uh, at least one uh, page in english uh, soon on, on uh, our website so thank you for your attention fantastic merci nathalie for your fantastic presentation and your fantastic work um and thank you to uh, all three of our um wonderful panel um, okay, that completes um, the panelists' speeches and presentations today. Um, so we'll now move on to answering some of the fantastic questions that have um, already come through uh, in the in the chat. Um, I think all the panelists can come on video now, um, but probably remain muted unless you are um, speaking. Um, and I thought we might start. Um, with a uh, a question that came in from um, uh, Olivier Tomata uh, in the chat, which is directed, I think, first Natalie and then secondly to Alex. Um, and Olivier was wondering whether one effective strategy to potentially bypass um, some of the complexities um, of the situation in France. Uh, might be to really put our energies into driving progress uh, at the European level uh, in Brussels. Very curious to hear from both of you uh, on that. And why don't we start with you, Nathalie, as the resident French expert? But I think it's. I think we we should work on both national and uh, European levels uh, because uh, working on a national level will have an influence on uh, the European level. I think it's important to work on both and because also all of the, the people uh, that are working on European level are from one country. <laughs> and I think also that some countries they have uh, uh, particularly uh, po yeah, just um, great, great influence on the Europe. Uh, some countries like France, for example, or like uh, Germany. So I think we also have to focus on some particular big and influential country uh, in Europe. So yeah. I think that we should work on both. Some decisions are made on European level, but can be influenced by things that are coming from certain countries. Great, thank you, Natalie. Um, Alex, do you have anything to add there by any chance? Just very briefly, I mean, I, I completely agree with Natalie. Um, national level matters, European Union level matters, and those two interact very strongly. Um, I think in addition to engaging in countries that are slightly more skeptical like France um, and really explaining and, and advocating for the benefits of, of cultivated meat and seafood, building up champions, other countries who are more open, um, tend to be more supportive, building those up as champions um, can be a huge impact then on the European level. Um, and in the end also um, having domestic startups and an ecosystem developing, that plays a huge role. And there actually there's a lot of hope I have for France because there are French startups um, making quite some progress developing cultivated meat. So um, there are some some hopeful signs there. Fantastic. Thank you, Natalie and Alex. Um, let's go now for one. I think mainly this will be in your um, uh, ballpark, Chris, um, which is a question from Pierce, um, who asked whether there are certain cultural values um, in Europe that may lead to a slower um, adaptation of cultivated meat 
um, compared to perhaps other continents. Um, are there anything, is there anything really particular about the peculiarities and specificities of the European context um, that, that companies and, and folks watching this should know? And I don't know, maybe if you want to, up to you, but if you want to delve a level deep, deeper and even think if there's any differences between uh, between nation states within Europe um, where um, uh, where those differences or even more stark differences might apply. Yeah, certainly seems to be the case. Um, it does seem that Europe in general has uh, somewhat more uh, traditional views about food and farming and maybe more connected to um, some of those kind of stories about the connection to the countryside and so on um, than we see in other parts of the world. Certainly in some communities, uh, that's going to be the case. There has been some data in the past that suggested um, that there was much higher acceptance of cultivated meat in the US compared to the UK, um, and that the UK is kind of somewhere in the middle with respect to Europe. Um, but more recent data actually shows pretty high acceptance across both the UK and the US, um, and and no difference between the two. Um, so that is that is more recent and more kind of uh, comprehensive data as well. So, uh, you know, it may not be the case, in fact, that there's this big gulf uh, across the Atlantic. Within Europe, though, um, yeah, there are some reasons to think that there are differences between countries. Uh, Alex and Natalie, of course, have mentioned France as uh, somewhere which might be particularly conservative, and that seems to be the case. Certainly a study uh, that I co-authored with Natalie uh, showed that the French were more conservative than German consumers with respect to cultivated meat. Germany seems to be uh, up there with the Netherlands and the UK and other countries which are very kind of pro-alternative um, proteins in general. Um, seems to be the case. Uh, so yeah, there's, there seems to be some variation within Europe as well. Fantastic. Um, I wondered if, if either Natalie or Alex wanted to um, pick up on anything there, or, or do we think it's um, uh, it's all being covered by Chris? I suspect it might have been. Maybe just one note. I mean, Chris is obviously the expert on consumer acceptance, but one thing um, when we think about the politics of regulatory approval, what um, could be interesting to look at very neutral countries, so just countries who are not on our radar as much as maybe France, um, the Netherlands, like two two sides of, of the same spectrum, but countries who, um, where there is a lot of um, indifference at the moment towards this topic um, on the side of consumers and politicians, but who actually have quite some influence on, um, on approval voting, like Romania or Poland. Um, so that's something I think to, to, to look at more in the future. Fascinating, cool. Okay, I think going back to Chris, we had an interesting question from um, Paul. Um, who is asking to know more um, about the, the research into the, uh, as, as it was dubbed in your um, slide deck, the, the retaliation piece. Um, is there any, can you go a level deeper on that by any chance, Chris? Yeah, so this was uh, an experimental study that we had uh, set up, uh, and there's a link to it in the chat. You can um, email me for a PDF if it's paywalled for you. Um, but what we did is we had the four different uh, kind of conditions, which were messages about the naturalness of cultivated meat. One was a control condition where we did not discuss naturalness, but just talked about other benefits of cultivated meat. And then we had these kind of three strategies for addressing the naturalness concern. In one condition, we were putting forward the idea that uh, actually cultivated meat is natural. So challenging the uh, idea that cultivated meat is unnatural and saying, you know, this is uh, replicates the process of, of cell duplication that we see in nature and so on. Um, so that was one condition. The second condition was what I think is kind of the correct response is to argue that naturalness shouldn't really matter. Naturalness doesn't really tell us anything about healthiness or uh, morality or anything else that people seem to think it does. Um, and therefore it shouldn't matter. So that was the second condition. Um, and the third was to basically say, well, you too, <laughs> to conventional meat, right? Conventional meat uh, entails breeding artificial um, sized animals and, and using hormones and antibiotics and so on. And so conventional meat's also very unnatural. Um, so those were the three arguments about naturalness. And then we had the one control condition, which didn't mention naturalness. 
And we saw quite modest uh, differences between the two, but where the measures did differ, we tended to see that arguing naturalness shouldn't matter or arguing that uh, actually cultivated meat is natural tended not to be so effective. So beliefs about those issues in those conditions were not different from beliefs about those issues in other conditions, i.e. people were no more or less likely to think that naturalness is important. Um, on the other hand, we did manage to affect beliefs about the naturalness of conventional meat. And so it seemed that kind of bringing that up uh, as a response was kind of a, a relatively good strategy. And the control condition, by the way, which just did not address naturalness um, and just talked about other benefits, also did better than those first two conditions that I mentioned. Um, so yeah, there's a link to that full study in the chat and I'm happy to share it with uh, anybody who can contact me. <laughs> Fascinating, thank you, Chris. Um, okay, here's an interesting question from uh, Mariana in the chat, um, who asks, did the pandemic have an impact on alternative protein regulation in Europe and did it increase the, the consumer acceptance? Um, and I guess we could also broaden that into, you know, any other uh, impact that we've seen from the from the from the last eighteen months or so. Um, I think it might be relevant to all three of you. So um, I'll, I'll throw it open to the floor to, to see if anyone wants to dive in on that one. Yeah, I can cover the regulation part. Um, the, the short answer is no. Um, the regulatory framework has not changed over the last eighteen months. There have been ongoing discussions at the EU level um, when it comes to regulatory treatment of um, uh, certain gene editing techniques, but those were already ongoing before the pandemic. So um, those timelines usually work um, yeah, in a longer way. So I don't think we, we see changes from that. Chris, well, I don't know if there's data Chris on that. Whether, whether you've spotted any, any impacts from the pandemic, or maybe it's too early to tell. Yeah. Yeah, I have seen, uh, I, I feel like I've seen a few different um, data points claiming kind of contrary things on here. So I'm hesitant to take a side. On the one hand, I have seen things saying that plant-based sales have increased uh, during the pandemic. On the other hand, I've also seen the same said for meat sales. So I don't know if it's just that food sales across the board are up as a result of change consumption. Um, it could be the case that, you know, if nothing else, the pandemic was a large disruption to usual routines and an unusual opportunity for reflection for lots of people. So, you know, conceivably under those conditions, more people might be uh, open to changing their diets in, in the direction of plant-based. Um, and more generally, in terms of, you know, time passing, we have some pre-pandemic data from 2019 and 2020 uh, from Belgium showing that except, uh, well, what is it? Satisfaction with uh, existing plant-based meat alternatives significantly increased in that time from 44% of people saying that they were satisfied in 2019 up to 51% in 2020. So uh, pandemic aside, it seems as though the passing of time is uh, positively correlated with um, acceptance here. Great. Matthew, anything to add from France? Don't feel don't feel obliged to, um, but uh, if you do have any comment. No, no nothing special. I just uh, saw that more and more people, they uh, see more clearly the advantages of uh, alternative proteins uh, because of uh, the risk of having pandemics coming from uh, industrial um, farms. Uh, so it's just something that make it uh, clear for them that, uh, yeah, things like uh, culture meat is a good thing. Uh, they, I think it's, it's just easier for for them to see these uh, advantages, health advantages. Mm -hmm. Great. Cool. It looks like in the chat we've had an upvote for a uh, question from Julie. Um, and I feel that, Chris, this might be best directed to you in the first instance. Um, and Julie was wondering, are, are there going to be any, you know, the, the, this issue of pot potentially um, cultivated coming first to market for for um, pet food, might that have knock-on effects on how it's perceived um, uh, in terms of uh, human consumption? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I certainly see the idea that it could be the case that you know there are uh, pet food products in the cultivated meat category that that can kind of bleed over to perceptions of other uh, applications. I think that branding plays a big role here um, and probably does more to separate the concepts in people's mind than um, 
than the kind of category overall. Of course, at the moment we have just conventional meat being eaten as both pet food and, and human food. Um, so it could well be the case that there's not an association. I think that the branding is really going to play a big role. Um, and even that can play a role kind of between different uh, cultivated meat brands. Um, you know, all for human consumption, there can be kind of different positioning within that as well. So, yeah, I think that uh, it's not something we should be overly concerned with. Um, and after all, actually, a shockingly high portion of the meat consumption is for pets um, and uh, oftentimes more difficult to replace as well. So I think it's a good application. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Uh, any thoughts from from uh, anyone else, Alex or Nathalie? No, I'm going to go straight to a very interesting question from Gabriel um, that's just popped up. Um, and Alex, this might be one for you. Um, and Gabriel writes, do we have any examples of past novel foods approval, pro approval processes that might shed light on what to expect from the process for cultivated meat? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and there are certainly a lot of examples of past uh, novel foods approvals that um, every company um, looking into this should should closely examine. Examine, And there are things to learn in terms of what are specific um, requirements that the European Food Safety Authority um, is, is, um, is making and what, what do they like to see. Unfortunately, in terms of um, concrete products from animal cell cultures, there are just none. So no, no company so far has made an application. There is one application that has been um, done last year and it is an apple cell culture so from the fruit so there might be some similarities there that companies want to look at um, and what we can learn is in terms of the timeline so um, it was on one of my slides the official estimate given for the whole novel foods authorization procedure is around 18 months but in reality we have seen for very um, very very novel products that have never been approved that can be much longer because in this last part of the approval a process, the risk management that I talked about, there are no legal deadlines. So the PAF committee can uh, deliberate over um, and, and months and months and months. So in terms of timelines, we're expecting more something around 18 to 24, maybe even a few months more. Um, so that's one of the one of the lessons we can learn. Fantastic. Thank you, Alex. Um, and yes, there's some fascinating stuff, interesting papers being dropped in the chat, I think, by Saren from the GFI team, um, which has got some uh, relevance um, to this question. OK, we are very, very almost at time. Um, I think we've got time just to squeeze in this, this last and good question from Marcia, um, who writes, what are the restrictions you view as for startups outside of Europe looking to access and participate in these markets? Um, and globally, Alex, am I right in saying that the, the, in terms of the regulations, it, it is agnostic, the regulation is agnostic as to whether the applicant is from within the EU or outside it, is that fair? No, that's exactly right. Um, the only difference might be that um, I mentioned that a domestic uh, startup, a company might have an easier time in um, gathering the political support of any country that it might represent. And if it is an outside company, that might be more difficult and um, like political um, realistic levels, but formally um, the regulation is agnostic. Great. Can I add really quickly on that last point? Um, a thing from the consumer data in general on uh, perceived meat quality is that nation of origin seems to be a very important si uh, signal of quality. And it's interesting because it's not that people necessarily think, you know, New Zealand lamb is the best or anything like that, but rather data shows that consumers from almost every country think that their country's meat is the best. So they all are just biased towards their own country's meat. And in the context of cultivated meat, I think this could be a really good thing because it means that it will be kind of a natural uh, force for spreading out the markets and the kind of companies coming from uh, different countries will all have unique opportunities within their own markets uh, because they'll have that kind of national branding. Uh, so I think that that can be a good thing too. 
Fascinating. Thank you, Chris. Um, and I think, um, believe it or not, it is time for us to start wrapping up as we do need to um, stick closely and carefully to time. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to um, uh, all of our experts on the panel. Uh, a big thank you uh, to everyone in the audience. Um, uh, and in particular, thanks for your um, thought provoking uh, questions. Um, a big thank you to Catherine Derrieux uh, and the rest of the behind the scenes uh, team who have uh, helped put this session and indeed the whole GFC together. Um, and as always, uh, and fundamentally, a huge thank you to all of the um, supporters uh, to, of um, GFI. We are powered by um, philanthropy um, and we are uh, ever grateful um, to all the members of our donor um, and supporter um, family. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, a clear message from today's session uh, is that Europe has enormous potential to be a world leader in cultivated meat, um, but that it's crucial to be aware of the political and cultural context and to adapt our approach and our actions accordingly. Um, Alex, Chris, Nathalie, and everyone at GFI and GFI Europe uh, is here to support companies and other uh, actors with this. So please do feel free to reach out to us. If you'd like to keep today's conversation uh, going, please do join the networking session that follows this uh, session. Um, to take part, you can either nav navigate back to the schedule and enter the Europe networking session, or just follow the instructions in your participant pack packet to invite attendees of this event to a one-on-one -on -one or to a group networking meeting. Uh, I'll just repeat that because uh, I always find that the tech um, sometimes tricky to, to navigate, especially when it's new. So if you want, basically, if you want to go to the networking session, um, well, simple, you just navigate back to the schedule and enter the Europe networking session um, or check out your participant packet and you'll be able to set up some one-on-ones um, or even a group networking meeting. Uh, if you would like to learn more about our experts' work, uh, please check out the resources in the additional information section of this session uh, and uh, feel free also to follow us on social media. Uh, and I think that brings us neatly to a close. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, and we'll see you uh, at the networking session, I hope. Take care. Yeah.